بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا عبد الله قاسم محمد الذين قضوا الله عنهم ورجسا وطهرهم كثيرا اللهم يا سلام محمد الظالم محمد قال الله الحكيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونقد كتبنا في الزغور من بعد الذكر أن العرض يريثها عبادي الصالحون صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم يا a series of discussions have gone into this fourth night. Yesterday we concluded on two realities. And that was that Islam is a continuation of a primordial religion that started from Adam. In the same way the reality of the coming of the Imam is depending on our deeds and actions. For all of the signs and all of these apocalyptic messages that we've got, within our scriptures, not starting from Islam, but going as far back as Judaism, we find that all of these can be deterred, if and only if we were to change our character, to change our akhlaq, to change ourselves and our communities and our societies. But as you look towards the 21st century and the society that we live in today, then many of those signs which are materializing today in terms of the person. In a tradition it says that two thirds of Muslims will become murtad, in the same way the tradition continues and says that there will be two extremes to Islam. That middle road will erode and you found that on one extreme there will be one side and on another extreme there will be the other side. Many of the experts on Mahdism have said that this Sunniism that we see today, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'at, will cease to exist in the next generation or so in a way that both of the sides will split into two. One will go to one extreme and one will go to the other extreme. We are seeing now that in the last 15 years there's been a movement of that. That you're seeing that that middle road, even within Tashayu, has removed. Go back 15 years ago, and what you see is that Tashayu had a middle road. As time goes on, you're seeing sect upon sect, you're seeing formation of different ideologies and cults, even within Tashayu. In fact, the tradition says that within Tashayu itself, there'll be four different denominations, and from those four, another four will develop. In total, 12 denominations will spread, in the same way when you go to the tradition of our brothers, you find the very same thing that the 73 sects that all of our traditions talk about, 40 of them will be from them and eventually 30 of them roughly will be from us. So in this way, 70 total, 3 more, 73. From those 73, one of them will be that sect, which they call Firche Najia. All of this can be prevented though. And as we said, the entire signs of the coming of the Imam are causal, cause and effect. That one action of ours can steer the entire course of destiny. One action. One action can create a war, and one action can change the entire fate of the world. This is why every Thursday night, we are awaiting the coming of that Imam to change our destiny, and to change the course of entire history. You've seen that before. You've seen it in the past. One action has changed the entire course of destiny. Go back to the Cold War, after World War II. In fact, go further than that. You've seen revolution upon revolution. One action, one movement, one stand changes the entire course of history. One Sayyid al-Shuhada changed the entire course of history from Adam to Khatam. In the same way, in the 20th century, you've seen various revolutions. One action by one man can change an entire course. The world is going in one direction. And what you find is that one action changes the entire course of the world. We have traditions to say the Imam would have come twice within history, 12th Imam. One of them in the time of the Abbasids, Ulama have said, he didn't come because we left everything to the signs, but we didn't prepare ourselves. One which they had once said. He said, rather than looking at all of the signs of the Dhuhr, create the revolution inside of yourself. Create the Dhuhr inside of yourself. If you were to create that, the awakening of the heart and the awakening of the mind, what you would see is the Imam would be in front of you. To quote that saying of Sayyid Ali Qadi, wretched is the eye that wakes up in the morning and does not do ziyar of the 12th Imam Each one of us has the potential to do ziyar of the master of the times. And this is why 
it's almost incumbent upon us to do that as well. The tradition says that if a person claims to have seen the Imam, he's a liar. Not a person who sees the Imam, but does not declare the fact that he sees the Imam. Human potential is that, that they have the ability to attach themselves with the Imam. As Ayatollah Wahid al-Qurasani once said, is that there is a light in the heart of the believer that connects to the light of the 12th Imam. Look inside of you and see. If you were to remove all your negativities, to go into that corner, to meditate, and within Islamic tradition it says, Muraqib is very important. To be Muraqib of oneself, to be vigilant of oneself. Allah Ma'at says if a person for 40 days did that, every single night, you would see changes inside of yourself. You would be able to connect to the realities. We sell ourselves short because we don't realize that there's a higher reality at play as well. We ingrain ourselves into the physical world. But man is a compound individual. You're created of two realities. One is the metaphysical reality, one is the physical reality. Your body is tied down to this physical finite reality, but your soul has been created until the end of time. The actual essence is your soul. Your soul has been created, your soul never dies. As long as Allah is alive, your soul is alive. And so therefore your soul living in the physical world has the ability to attach onto various realities which are far greater than this. 99% of the world don't realize that. But it's that 1% of the world, when they realize that, they have that ability to attach. That when you go to the haram of the imam, when you say salam, you should be able to hear the reply come back. This isn't something which is foreign. There are many people in this world who we know have the ability to do that. I remember a friend of mine who passed away. says that whenever he would go to the haram of the prophet and give salam, the reply would come back. The individuals like that in the world, not just of generations gone by, but the reality is this, that you must remove materialism from inside yourself. Now removing materialism, as we said yesterday, is not the fact that you become a dervish, wear a woolen rug, and decide to go outside wandering in minus two temperatures. The reality of a person who's divorced themselves from the world is that they live within the world, but they're not attached to the world. If you were to ask them, what are you willing to sacrifice for the sake of the Imam? They'd be willing to give up everything. It's very difficult, especially living in this day and age. It's very difficult to remove all of those attachments. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, for us to prepare ourselves for the Imam requires us to remove those attachments. If you go back to Asul Kafi, the final bab within Asul Kafi says that the greatest dhikr which has been given by Allah to mankind is the tahleel. The dhikr of La ilaha illallah. The essence of La ilaha illallah, nevertheless. And the Imams, there is an entire bar, there's an entire chapter on that. If one was to recite this continuously, you'd get to a stage. One mystic says, he says that I recited it in one day 70,000 times, I saw my maqam in heaven. He said, I recited it for my enemy 70,000 times, 70,000 times. My enemy was removed from hell and taken to heaven. The byproduct of this, though, it is the best dhikr, but it's the most dangerous dhikr as well for a person who doesn't know what he's doing. One of the greatest byproducts of this is that it brings poverty to you. That's why you see all of the orafa, none of them were rich. Ayatollah, Gharuya Kampani in Najaf, the teacher of Ayatollah Bahja, they called him Kampani because he had companies. His father was a multi-millionaire in a time in Iraq, especially when there was poverty. Tradition says that this is going back before World War I. It says that when he was young, he was stuck in Karbala. His father chartered an entire train to take him back to Najaf. Ayatollah Garabi Kampani says, says that my final days, his final days came. As he was walking with food in his hand, the bag opened and it collapsed and the food went onto the floor. He smiled himself. He says, I remember those days when my fa father would hire a train to take me from Karbala to Najaf. And today as I'm walking, I'm walking in such a way that I'm in poverty. But you know what? I'm content in my poverty because I've realized the essence of life. And the essence of life is far greater than the material world. It gets to a stage. If you truly want to climb, La ilaha illallah essentially means this. That there is no attachment but Allah. Allah will test you. The more you recite this, the more Allah tests you. So Allah Ma'at said, be very careful as to your preparation before you recite something. Why? 
because that thing which you are citing has byproducts. He says that there are three things that has no byproducts at all. But this la ilaha illallah is essentially, as the Orafah says, the warmest of all afghar, dhikr. Why? Because it takes you very quickly towards Allah. But if you're not prepared, what happens? It also brings trial and tribulation, accelerates them within your life. If you're attached to your wife, you'll be tested. If you're attached to your children, you'll be tested. In the Quran it says, put a dhikr to one side. Quran says, if you claim to be a believer, you're not going to be tested. Surely you're going to be tested. It will test you, the Quran says, with fear, with hunger, with your family, with your wealth. There will be a time that will come where all of these things will be tested. Today, maybe you're driving a nice car. Tomorrow, Allah may test you with that. Your life, your properties, your families. Every angle of your life will be tested. Sayyid al-Shuhada wasn't immune from that either. If you go to Sayyid al-Shuhada, you'll see that every angle of his life was tested. The difference was though that Allah tested Sayyid al-Shuhada. Sayyid al-Shuhada would reply and say, Allah, take more if you're not satisfied with me. Continue to take. It gets to the stage where Allah Himself says, Ya nafsul ila The success isn't the fact that we're able to sacrifice. The success is the fact that Allah says that I'm satisfied with you. That's what the difference is. In this day and age, then, in this world that we're looking in front of us and we're seeing around us trials and tribulations take place, how is it possible for us to preserve ourselves? You see, the biggest sign before the coming of the Day of Judgment is the fact that man, Muslims, will go astray. That the majority of Muslims will leave the path. They'll go towards astray. The question is, is how do we identify this within ourselves? If you look, you found that in Karbala there was an individual by the name of Khur. For every individual that you find within Karbala who came forward to Imam Hussein, there was a reason why he came forward. If you delve deeper than that, you realize that this journey of Hur, this awakening of Hur, takes place right on the last day. But before that, he was on the side of the enemy. What is it that takes a person to the side of the enemy? You look to the camp of Yazid, and you found that the likes of Shimr were there. Which Shimr? Shimr who was with Amir al muminin in the Battle of Siffin. You found the likes of, for example, Umar ibn Sa'ad. Who is Umar ibn Sa'ad? The killer of Sayyid al-Shuhada. But nevertheless, you find him on the side of Amir al muminin if you go back 20 odd years or so. So in this way, there were many people who were with Amir al-Mu'mineen and you found that within a course of time, they left Amir al-Mu'mineen. What is it today, if you look within ourselves, what are those signs that will take us towards destruction? Do we have those signs within us? Hur believed until the 9th of Muharram that he was correct. In the same way that many of us believe today that we're correct, but we're not on the right path. A lot of times what happens is that we go into the state of lull. We don't realize that these signs are within us. Akhir al-Zaman is that time that many people will go astray. People won't realize that they're going astray. Look at the tradition. It says that elders will become strict and stern. Poor people will become liars. The rich will become stingy. That tells us that Islam is saying just the opposite of that. Rich people should be giving. Poor people should not be liars. The elderly should be merciful. The children, it says in the tradition, children will become rude and arrogant to the elders. Which means that Islam tells us the other way around. And in this way the tradition continues. It says this, those things which are good will become negative, and those things which are negative will become good. When someone goes forward to another person and says to them, brother you're doing something wrong, it will be seen as offensive. You go back to the tradition and you see that that person who comes and does Islam of you has done you a favor. And then you realize that the way that they do Islam, let's say the two or three people that do come and say, brother, you're doing this wrong, they'll have an agenda. In the tradition it says this, Amr bil Ma'aruf has ten criteria to this. You know, many a time people come to the alim, especially in a community. Now you don't get along with your brother. And you know, for example, let's say for example, your brother doesn't have a beard. So one person will come to the alim and say, please, can you talk about the fadila of beards? And they will sit there at the back smiling at the fact that he's got one over the other. A criteria for Amr bil Ma'ruf. When you go forward to do that, the intention shouldn't be for me to disgrace someone. If your intention is to disgrace someone, what happens? That will come back onto you again. No one thing. For every time you do something to disgrace somebody else, within your own lifetime you'll be disgraced in the same way. And don't ever think that you're doing something to disgrace that person. 
It's not the case. Allah takes care of them. Remember, on the very first day we said, the oppressor and the oppressed, the relationship is such. Don't ever say anything negative to a person who's oppressed. The day the ah comes out from his chest and he beseeches his Lord, that is your downfall. You've seen many politicians down. Namrud's downfall was what? When Ibrahim raised his hands. Fir'aun's downfall was what? When Bani Israel raised their hands. In the same way, the downfall you find of every... Abu Sufyan's downfall was what? Look at it and see. When the Prophet of God was not alone. In the same way, what was the downfall of Yazid? When say the Zainab walks into Sham, the downfall of Yazid begins. What will be our downfall? In the tradition it says, the downfall of the Muslims will be the arrogance. Who's the biggest enemy of Islam today? Ever thought about it? Look at all of the signs before the coming of the Imam. The biggest enemy of the Muslims is the Muslims themselves. No, let's go further and look at the tradition of Amir al-Mu'mineen. The biggest enemy of the Muslims is the ignorance of man himself. Further than that, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, your ignorance is yourself. We are our biggest enemies. Abu Sufyan, as long as he was a non-Muslim, the enemy was open. The day Abu Sufyan became a monafiq, a hypocrite, the enemy was no more open and apparent. Islam's downfall began. Within the period of a couple of days almost, the entire dynamics of Islam changed after the death of the Prophet. The dynasty of 83 year worth of governance of Banu Umayyah later began after 25 years. In the same way, you come into tradition and you realize the difference between the Dajjal and Sufiani is that in the tradition it says Sufiani will be a murderer. He will massacre the followers of the Ahlul Bayt in a way that history has never seen. But tradition says Sufiani is not your biggest enemy. Why? Because he may be able to kill you, but your biggest enemy is the one who kills your Iman. The Dajjal is that person that tradition says he will come. In the tradition it says big white beard. Trousers lifted. <laughs> Shirts big. Big turban on his head. But when the Dajjal comes, the method of the Dajjal will be that he will come as your friend, but he will corrupt your deen. The Dajjal will come forward, he will destroy all of your Iman. Why? Because the Dajjal will be one of you. The Dajjal will come as a friend to you. In the same way, Akhir Zaman is that time. That people will come to you, your company will misguide you. Yesterday we said that if a person, for example, gossips, or if a person is jealous, these are signs that take him away from the path and take him to destruction. The first ever action which was committed, which destroyed shaitan and took him away from Islam was what? The fact that he was jealous. And we concluded yesterday, according to that tradition in a Safi, by the fifth Imam, that that tree that Adam ate from, one of the virtues or the vices of that tree was that it was a tree of hasad, jealousy. When Adam ate from that, he came into the physical world. In the same way, when Shaitan was jealous, he was removed from the boundaries of Islam. That tells us that jealousy is that vice. And to develop that, backbiting is that vice. Envy is that vice that takes us away and takes us away from Islam. But to continue, in the tradition it says that there are five or six things, qualities, that if... Those qualities, and I use the term qualities because in the tradition it says, Akhir zaman will be that time that vice will be seen as a quality. So these will be seen as qualities within man, but they're not qualities within man, they're vices. they are five or six certain vices which are found within man, you'll go astray. Look inside of yourself and see, do I have them? They don't just become apparent. When a person starts going astray, it's years and years and years development that takes place. You don't go astray within one day. Amir al-Mu'mineen says that be in good company because after 40 days negativity starts rubbing off on you. If a person is a show-off, for example, it's possible that quality of showing off may not come onto you. But let's say you have a weakness and your weakness is lying. That lying becomes manifest within you after 40 days. This is why the tradition says once every 40 days, if you do not go to an alim or rabbani, your heart begins to die. Akhir zaman is that time where the tradition says there will be very few ulama left. But those ulama will be alim and rabbani. They will be the inheritors of the knowledge of the prophets. What does that mean? That means that they'll have the ability to revive the hearts. If once every 40 days you were to go to them, your heart would be revived. 
the first stage that you should understand and I should understand. I need to look inside of myself. You need to look inside of yourself. This is Akhir Zaman. Look inside of yourself and see. Do I have this vice? The first vice is this. That man will start leaving the dhikrullah. Sayyid al-Shuhada comes into the tent of Imam Zain al-Abudin alayhi salam. Imam Zain al-Abudin looks towards him and says, Father, why are these people intent on killing you? Have you not told them your fadayah? Have you not told them your qualities? Imam says, yes, I've told them. Imam Zain al Abidin then says, he says, haven't you told them you're the grandson of the Prophet? Haven't you told them that you're the prince of the people of paradise? Didn't you tell them that your mother is Zahra? Why are they intent on killing you for? Imam replies in a beautiful way. He says, because they've removed themselves and distanced themselves from Dhikrullah. What does Dhikrullah mean? It doesn't necessarily just mean reciting Allah and Ya Rahman and Ya Rahim and all of these things. Dhikrullah is a state of being. This state of being manifests itself in your daily life. But the biggest sign of whether or not you're moving away from Allah or not are your five daily prayers. Or a five said, ulama have said, regardless of what you are and how you are, whatever sin you may do, and I'm not saying do sin, but I'm saying that whatever sin you may do, make sure that you pray your prayers on time. Why? Because there's still hope for a person regardless of the sins of his praying. God forbid you've gone into the act of committing any of the major sins. Whether it's lying, whether it's gossiping, whether it's backbiting, whether it's committing zina. In the tradition it says a person who backbites, 40 days the door of Rahma is closed. A person who drinks alcohol, even one puff of weed for example is sufficient enough to close the doors of Rahmah. If you were to die in those 40 days, you'd die the death of the Kafir. But the ulama of akhlaq say, even if that befalls you, make sure you don't stop prayer. Maybe Allah may forgive you. Why? Because your prayer is the mercy of Allah upon you. If you want to know if mercy is leaving you, you'll see that slowly your prayers become delayed and delayed and delayed until that point it becomes qadha. Then you end up reciting your qadha prayers at night time, but in a week or two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, even those qadha then go out the window and your prayers stop. When those prayers stop, know that Allah's mercy has been taken away from you. What happens then? You go into terminal decline. You feel that your life is progressing. But your life is not progressing. Your life is going down. Why? Because Allah has removed that rahmah. The dhikrullah. Dhikrullah is a state of being. Whatever you do, this is akhir zaman Be very careful that you are praying your prayers. Many people will say, well look, when the dhuhr time comes, we have businesses. We're worried that our business may fail. I've seen with my own eyes, some of the most successful businessmen in central London, when I asked them, what is your sir? What is your secret? They said that we remember even on a Friday we would close our shops. Many of our colleagues would say, what is going to happen to your shop? Surely your business is going to be affected. Today, those very people, if you were to look into the magazines and newspapers, their name is there. When I asked them, I remember asking them directly, what is your secret? They said that we prayed our prayers on time, regardless of whether people said that our business was going to decline or not. Seeing that, in the 80s, in the 90s, there are examples of models of the Ahlul Bayt within your own communities within London, who are very successful within business. They were successful because of this prayer. Whatever happens, however it happens, whether you have pharmacies, whether you're doctors, whether you're businessmen, regardless of who you are, what you are, remember your five daily prayers. Make sure that doesn't leave you. Make sure that's there, embedded. Why? As dhikrullah stops, what you found is that you go away from the path. One vice, that's the first vice, of a person who's gone astray. Develop this argument. When you go to university, when you go to school, when you go to college, when you're sitting with your friends, examine yourself and see, do my friends bring me closer to Allah? Or do, do they take me away from Allah? Today, 
especially within the 21st century, especially within 2014. If you go back to the traditions, you'll see this. Athur Zaman is that time when many people will claim to be religious, but their actions won't be that of a religious person. They'll attend the mosque. The tradition says this, that mosques will be full, Athur Zaman. Brothers will be side by side praying on the first line, but in their hearts will be jealousy to one another. In their hearts will be enmity to one another. They'll be praying side by side. They'll be in mosques. They'll claim to be religious. Go back 20 years, you'll find that in those days, people who would come to mosques would openly talk about the fact that they'd been to a nightclub, they'd been, they'd been going raving, partying, all of these things. Today, our youth, if you look at them, come into the mosque and see not one of them will openly claim haram in the mosques anymore. In the space of 15, 20 years, the entire dynamics have changed. Generations have changed. But when you look at some of our youth today, even though outwardly they may be religious, but they are committing acts which are taking them far away from the deen. Look towards your company. It's very important. <coughs> Don't look at the labels. Don't look at the fact that a person has a big beard. Don't look at the fact that a person, for example, outwardly is doing something. Look and see, does that person bring me towards Allah or not? Look at his actions. Do his actions reflect Islam or not? By me sitting with him, is he bringing the best out of me or the worst out of me? Sometimes it's better to be a loner in life than to be a person who's crucified the Iman. <coughs> Who knows when we're going to pass away, right? Death has no logic. In the last two months, we've seen more deaths within our community in the United Kingdom than we've seen in the last couple of years. 100 more deaths within our communities from London to Birmingham have taken place within the last two months. Young as 18, as old as 90. Do you think death has any logic? Do you think Allah is going to ask you before removing your soul? If death can come at any time, surely that should be a rude awakening to you. Surely that should say to you, wake up and smell the coffee. Don't become one of those people who leaves the path of the Ahlul Bayt right at the last moment. One, the dhikr of Allah. Two, in the tradition it says, it says a person who suffers from nifaq, a person who's a hypocrite. Hypocrisy goes far deeper than just being a person who claims to be a Muslim and is not a Muslim. For example, hypocrisy is within your daily life. Look and see. Does my heart agree with my actions? That is hypocrisy. Look deep inside of yourself. Does my heart agree? Those actions which I'm committing, am I doing those actions? Are they in sync with my heart or not? Go deeper and see. In one of the traditions it says, it says that a person will die the death of a kafir, for example, if he helps an oppressor. See inside of yourself. I can say this very easily. Do my actions dictate that I'm helping an oppressor or am I against an oppressor? What is oppression? What is standing up against oppression? When you see a person being oppressed, that could be a person within your own family. To make a decision without knowing the full dynamics, what does that mean? That means that you've become an oppressor. If I don't know the full extent of something, I should not come to a conclusion. And you're seeing people are doing that today. In our societies within our communities. Second thing, nifaq. Third thing. And that third thing, as we develop, it becomes more apparent. Do we have these things or not? Because they become very subtle. The third thing is this. To do taqlid of somebody, negative taqlid. You've got positive taqlid, negative. To do the taqlid of a mujtahid or an expert is an honorable thing. But to do the taqlid of a person who takes you towards misguidance is an evil thing. Now the question is this, what taqlid am I talking about? Taqlid basically means following a person. Following a person blindly. It could be your father, it could be your mother, it could be your friends, it could be your society, it could be your relatives. When I use the term taqlid, I don't necessarily mean taqlid of a mujtahid. Taqlid basically means this. Your car breaks down, you call the AA. The AA say you have to give X amount of money to repair your car. That's doing taqlid, essentially. Taqlid has always been there within humanity. Why? To follow an expert in something or to take advice from someone who knows about something, that technically is known as taqlid. Akhir zaman is that time 
where somebody will say something negative about a person to you, without even examining that thing, you'll form an opinion of that person. That is negative taqlid. If you are a person who is doing that, and not giving the other brother the benefit of the doubt, that means that you are going towards <coughs> doom and negativity. Amir al-Mu'mineen says in Nahj al-Balagha, there's a four-finger difference between haq and batil. Four fingers. Between your eyes to your ears, four fingers. Haq is when you see something, batil is when you hear something. We know all of these things. Are we applying them? Five of our friends come to us and say, so-and-so is a bad person. Without even examining it, what happens? Take it on board. That's what the Imam says. He says, don't make a decision one way or the other until you don't have complete knowledge of something. Do we have complete knowledge of something? No. Are we making those decisions in life? Yes. Are we giving people the benefit of the doubt? No. Many of us aren't. What does that tell us then? That tells us that we have those vices within us that will take us away towards politics. Those vices within us that will take us astray. Be very careful. Develop that argument forward. What else? Imam says this now. In the tradition it says, a person, a person, who leaves the haq, the truth, who goes away from the decisions of Allah, will go astray. Now if you were to ask anyone, everyone will say, I follow what Allah says. I follow the truth. Truth is manifested within our actions. I'll give you two stories to emphasize this. The first story is found here. Burayr. Burayr on the day of Ashura comes to who? Umar ibn Sa'ad. Sister Umar ibn Sa'ad, do you know that you've found a pathway towards hell? Umar ibn Sa'ad says, I know that the action that I'm committing will take me to hell. What takes a man to that level that he says, I know that I'm going to go to hell. But you know what he says? He says, the city of Ray, which is Tehran at the moment, the wheat of that smells too good to me. What did Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad say? Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad calls Umar ibn Sa'ad. He says to Umar ibn Sa'ad, I'm going to give you the governorship of Ray if you take an army and kill Hussein. You know what Umar ibn Sa'ad says? He says, write it down on paper that you're going to give me this. And then afterwards he says, look, has a, another change of heart. He says, I don't want to do this. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad says, listen, I guarantee you that you'll get the governorship of Ray on the condition you take an army and fight with Hussein. He says, give me one night. In the tradition it says, Umar ibn Sa'ad comes into the house, worried, sweating, pacing it in the house. He says to his son, he says, call all of the elders of our family. I want to hold a meeting. Make dinner and call all of the elders. Why, father? He says, because I have a very important decision which is life and death to make. He calls all of the elders. As he sits there with them, he says, what is your decision? Should I go to Karbala? Shouldn't I go to Karbala? One person says yes. One person says no. One person says yes. And this way, it comes to a person sitting there. That person was his cousin, the son of his aunt. He says to the son of his aunt, tell me, should I or shouldn't I go to Karbala? That man replies to Umar ibn Sa'ad. He says, cousin, I've heard from the Prophet of God that when a person asks you for advice, it becomes incumbent upon you to give him honest advice. This is why you see that Sayyid al-Shuhada even advises his enemies, why Imam Zain al-Abidin even advises Marwan, the killer of his father. Who was the killer? Initially, the person to take Sayyid al-Shuhada and push him out of Medina was Marwan. At that moment, this man says to him, he says, Umar ibn Sa'ad, listen very carefully to what I'm going to say, because this will affect the entire course of destiny in your life. He says, I remember one day I was with your father, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. says, both of us went hunting one day. As we were going hunting, we lost our track. And as we lost our track, we lost the deer. We searched and searched and searched for the deer. But the fact was we were lost. That night we went to sleep in the forest because we couldn't find the track. In the morning when we woke up, we were thirsty. The next day we spent searching to the extent that both of us were about to pass out. As we were about to pass out, we saw a light coming from a distance. 
We said, surely there must be inhabitants there. Maybe they may be able to give us water. As our horse went towards that direction, as we came in, we saw that there was a monastery there. That monastery, there was a light on top of that monastery. Since we knocked on the door, and as we knocked on the door, a monk came out. And when that monk looked towards us, he asked us, who are you and where have you come from? They answered, they said, we are from the Ummah of the final prophet and we're thirsty. At that moment, the monk takes us inside. He gives us water and he says a very strange thing. He says, are you from that final prophet who we've been told within our scriptures will kill the grandson of that prophet, that Ummah? At that moment, they said, are you serious? Has this surely been written in your scriptures? The monk replies and says, yes. Within our scriptures has been written that the prophet of Akhur Zaman will come and that prophet's grandson will be slaughtered by the Ummah. <clears throat> These two replied and said, we replied, no, it can't be us. Surely it can't be us. <coughs> At that moment, the monk goes into the books, looks at Sa'ad Sa ibn Abi Waqqas, he says, from the description that we have from our ulama, you fit the description of the father of the killer of the grandson of the Prophet. Mm -hmm. So at that moment when Sa'ad goes home, he says to his family, make sure and keep an eye on Umar, because it's possible that he may be the killer of Sayyidah Shuhada. At that moment, the tradition says this, Umar ibn Sa'ad raises his head, and says, my decision has been made. I'm now going to Karbala to kill Hussein ibn Ali. Why? How oh, nafs. And Buraira now says, the day of Ashura, Umar ibn Sa'ad, don't you know? Hell waits for you. He says, I know hell waits for me. I know my Akhirah is in hell. But what can I do? My nafs is telling me, go to Ray take the governorship. At least for 20 years I'll live in peace. At least for 20 years I'll enjoy myself. Short-sightedness of a person. What takes a person to get to that stage? Are we not doing the same thing in our daily life? Look deeper and see. The time of Fajr comes. It becomes Kaaba. What are you doing? Allah is telling you to pray and you're not praying. This is a slow builder. Umar ibn Sa'ad didn't become Umar ibn Sa'ad in the space of one night. It took a 40 year development process for Umar ibn Sa'ad to become Umar ibn Sa'ad. If today you are helping those people who are oppressors, if today you are not giving the benefit of the doubt to the other people, if today, for example, you are not fasting, if today you know that hijab is wajib and you're not wearing hijab, and maybe it may come as these words, very striking for some people. Look, I'm going to go home tomorrow. I have to give reply to the 12th Imam as well. I'm going to say many things that you don't like. And the reason why I say this is because on the Day of Judgment, Allah will ask me, did you do your responsibility? If you are not wearing hijab and you know what hijab is wajib. If you're not following the Risale Amaliya, which says it's ihtiyat wajib to keep a beard, for example, and maybe I may become very unpopular. <laughs> but the reality is this. Do you want to be saved or not? It doesn't make a difference to me. I'm going to go and migrate, right? Whether you keep a bid, whether you give charity, whether you give sadaqah, whether you give khums, whether you pray or not makes no difference on my life at all. Believe me. But the reason why we say this is because Ammar bil Ma'aruf becomes wajib. If the ulama don't do it from the member, what happens? The traditions say that the entire nation becomes misguided. As long as ulama continue from the pulpit to do Amr bil Ma'ruf, firstly applying it on themselves and then the people, he found the nation becomes and remains strong. <laughs> These are those qualities of a person who will go astray. Go inside of yourself and see now. Do I have them or do I not have them? Islam is easy, yes. But at the same time, to follow on the way of Sayyidah Shahada is not easy. Who are the Shia? Look, go and look at the traditions and see. Shias are those people who follow the root of the Imam 
follow the road of the Imam. They do ada'at of the Imam. If the Imam says stand up, they stand up. If the Imam says sit down, they sit down. It's the qualities. Look deep. Am I following those qualities? Am I moving forward in those qualities? Am I making a difference? Yes? Well and good. No, if those signs are coming inside of you, do something to change that. As these nights slowly leave us, and these nights are nights of mourning, I know many of you have come from very far away just to mourn for Sayyid al Shahada. Tonight, according to our traditions, is the night where we commemorate the Shahadat of Hur alayhi salam. In the space of 24 hours, Hur becomes timeless. Hur joins the army of Sayyid al Shahada. Today I was coming here, and as I came here, I was thinking to myself that many people have asked us to pray for them. I know that maybe a lot of you brothers are living close by, but I know many sisters are coming from very far away. Some of them are driving by themselves to be here. Some of them are with their families. And many of them in the last couple of nights have said that we have trials and tribulations within our life. Many of them come here to cry for Sayyid al-Shahada, to open their heart. Many hearts are broken tonight. No one thing. The solution for your problems lies in the majalis of Imam Hussain. But today I feel like asking the sisters one question. And the question is this. In the next 10 minutes or so, you're going to cry for Imam Hussain. You're going to be sitting there within your own comfort shedding tears, opening your heart up. Today there's no one to prevent you from crying. There's no one to take your hijab. There's no one to hit you. There's no one to beat you. You're going to go home for those sisters who are there whose fathers are waiting for them, whose family members and husbands are waiting for them. <clears throat> whose sons are waiting, whose daughters are waiting. But if you go back to Karbala, there's a reality that comes into play. In the tradition it says this, that the one person who all of the Ahlul Bayt prevented from crying was that four-year-old girl of Sayyid al-Shuhada. Why? Have you ever seen in your own lifetime? You may have seen this. A child, as that child is walking or talking, a grown-up comes and they beat that child. What goes on your heart when you see a child being beaten or there's domestic violence that takes place? We can't take it on television when we see a child being beaten. Four-year-old, three and a half, two years old. Person come and abuses a child. What's the first reaction that comes onto your mind? Imagine Karbala. Imagine if that child is your child. What goes on your heart? Now go back and see. Imagine this. Imagine that, for example, you're a brother and you're 21 years old, and you have a sister who's four years old. Imagine your hands are tied behind your back, and imagine your neck is tied to a camel. Imagine if a man comes forward and sees your sister, and your sister is young, and he comes towards your sister, and as a brother you're watching your sister, and he comes and he takes his hand. In the tradition it says that man who came forward and he bought his hand, his hand was coarse. In the tradition it says he raised his hands and he hit his hands on the head of a four-year-old girl. He says he hit her head so hard that she began to spin around. And as she spun around, she hit the floor. And as she hit the floor and she got up, she tried to speak. As she tried to speak, she started to stutter. That stutter remained with her until that night when the head of Sayyid al-Shuhada was brought to her. She lifts up the head of Sayyid al-Shuhada. She says, Father, forgive me that I stutter when I speak to you. But when Shimmer hits me on the 11th day, it was so powerful that from that day onwards, 
up in stuttering. Imagine that brother, what must have gone on his heart when he saw his sister being beaten like that. They say Imam Zain al Abidin tears come in his eyes. He looks towards the head of Sayyid al-Shuhada. He says, Father, forgive me that me as a brother can't do anything for my sister. Had my hands not been tied behind my back, I would have gone and saved my sister. He looks towards Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. He says, Uncle Abbas, I know you cared a lot about my sister. What can I do but my neck is tied in this way? See, already tears have come into your eyes. As you sit and know that Zahra is watching each one of you. When a mother sees that, that went on the heart of Imam Zain al Abidin. Now imagine Sakina's mother when she saw that, what she must have been feeling. Some of you have daughters, right? Sons' pain you can take, but I know many fathers can't take the pain of their daughters. Imagine now, as a mother or as a father, seeing your daughter in that state, what would you have done? Know that there's another mother. Mothers sacrifice for the sake of their children, right? Look around the world and see. One mother sacrificed everything she had. When you go to Karbala, you see four million people there. You see five million people there. On the day of Arbain, you may see 20 million people there. Imam Hussein's body may, may have been broken, but the fact is that there are people standing there to cry with Imam Hussein. In the same way, when you go to Najaf, you see that there are people with Amir al muminin as well. Maybe a couple of years ago, the domes in Samara were demolished, but today those domes have recovered now. When you go to the grave of the Prophet, there are people there with the grave of the Prophet. When you go to Baqi, maybe Baqi has been demolished, but at Fajr time, you go there to give your salams. There is one grave in the world today that nobody goes to, and that is the broken grave of Fatima the Zahra, which is still alone. That mother sacrificed everything that she had to make sure that her 11 sons and her husband and her father today, people remembered. But that mother is alone there, and that mother comes here, and she looks at your broken hearts, and she looks into your eyes, and she looks into your tears. The only thing that brings peace to that mother's heart is when tears come and you say, Ya Hussein. <laughs> And mother is looking, she's watching. There's a tradition from the fourth Imam alayhi salam. The tradition goes like this. They say when tears come into us, raise your hands. Today there shouldn't be anyone who walks out of here without their du'as not being fulfilled. If you can understand this tradition from the fourth Imam, I swear to you, whenever you remember this, you'll cry. You know what that tradition is? That tradition made the Imam cry. I'm going to tell you this tradition. Feel this tradition, understand this tradition. If this tradition penetrates your heart, whenever you think of this tradition, it will bring tears to your eyes. You know what that tradition is? The tradition is this. The fourth Imam is walking through the streets of Medina. As he walks through the streets, a man comes to him. He says to him, we've heard that you've given nispa to the crucifixion of your father that people say that your father was killed like an animal is killed. He says that they say that your father was slaughtered like a sheep is slaughtered. He says, Mala, tell me, what is the reality of this? Imam Zain al Abidin looks towards him, he says, man, you wounded me. He says that, yes, my father was killed like a sheep is killed. But no one thing, when a sheep is killed, right, when a sheep is killed, that sheep is given water, aren't they? That person replies, says, yes, we give water and food to the sheep before we slaughter them because your grandfather has said to feed animals before they slaughter them. Imam replies and he turns around and said, my father was killed in a way that he wasn't given any food and water. And then Imam Zain al Abidin continues. He says, when you kill your sheep, right, are you, is the knife sharp or not? The man replies, he says that when we butcher our sheep, says the knife is sharp says that my father was killed in such a way that the knife was blunt. Imam Zain al Abidin then continues. He says, and when you butcher your animals, you take all of the other animals and you put them to one side so that they don't see the butchering of that animal. He says, yes, we do. He says that Zainab was watching from 70 paces away as her father was, as her brother was killed in this way. So then Imam Zain al Abidin continues. The man says that Imam Zain al Abidin told me, how is it possible that your Father was butchered like an animal. 
Imam replies, he says, the reason being is that when a sheep is being slaughtered, there's no one to turn around and say, don't slaughter that sheep. It says in the tradition, when my father was being slaughtered, there was no one to stop him from being slaughtered. Only my aunt Zainab was saying, stop and don't slaughter my brother like this. That is the reality of Imam Hussain. Slaughtered like an animal, but not conventionally. Slaughtered because no one was there to say, don't slaughter. They say that Hur takes an army. Outside of Kufa, he comes and he intercepts Sayyid al -Shuhada. As he intercepts him, he comes forward and he says to the Imam, stop grabs the reins of Sayyid al-Shuhada's horse. Sayyid al-Shuhada looks towards him and he says towards him, Hur, what do you want? <coughs> Hur says that my army of a thousand men are thirsty and our animals are also thirsty. Sayyid al-Shuhada gets on his horse, he says to Abbas, he says, Abbas, take out all of the water that we have and feed the army of Hur and feed the animals. In the tradition, it says, Abbas goes one by one and gives each one of the army of Hur water. At that moment, after Hur has drank water, after his animals have drank water, Hur looks towards Imam Hussein, raises his voice and says, Hussein, I want to take you to another location. At that moment, Sayyid the shuhada looks up towards Hur, says, Hur, Lower your voice. He says, why? He says, because my sister is standing behind me and she can't take it when somebody raises their voice towards me. Hora looks to her, say the Shamada. He says, the time of prayer has come. Why don't we pray? At that moment in the tradition, it says, Say the Shamada says, why don't you pray? And we'll pray our own prayers. Hor says, no. I want to pray behind you. Oh. Hor prays behind Sayyidu Shuhada, acknowledging the fact that he's the grandson of the Prophet. As Imam Hussein now gets onto the reins of his horse, Hor again grabs onto the reins. At that moment, Imam Hussein looks towards Hor and says, may your mother be deprived. They say a revolution takes place in the heart of Hur. He looks up to Imam Hussain and he says, he says, had your mother not been Zahra, I would have replied and said something to you. They say that now Hur comes towards Karbala. They say the second day comes, third day comes, fourth day comes, fifth day comes, Hur is in the tent. They say that Hur is pacing himself when the ninth day comes. As the ninth day comes, they say a person comes, Masab comes towards Hur. He says, Hur, you look as if you're worried. Why are you pacing it up and down like this for? Hur replies and he says, because I know that I'm lying between heaven and hell. He says, I don't know what to do. He says, at that moment, Hur comes out. Masab says, Hur, where are you going? He says, it's very hot here and my animals are very thirsty. I'm going to give them water. As he goes towards giving his animals water he has children saying al atash al atash al atash it says he comes back now he says to Masab he says my mind is made now I want to go towards Jannah he says where does Jannah lie he says Jannah lies with Hussein then he says I want to go towards Hussein Masab says I want to come with you in the tradition it says he goes to his son he says son why don't you tie my hands for he says why should I tie your hands father he says because these were the hands that held the reins of the horse of the son of Zahra he he says, tie my eyes as well. He says, why tie your eyes? He says, because these were the eyes that looked in ghadab towards Hussein. He said, tie me and make sure that you drag me on the ground towards Hussein. He says, father, why should I drag you? He says, because the daughters of Ali and the daughters of Zahra today are in pain because of me. Drag me towards Hussein. Says he began to drag Hussein towards Hussein. In the tradition it says, Imam Hussein says, we've got a guest coming, Abbas. Why don't you go and receive our guest? Which Abbas? And that Abbas who's seen the oppression that Hor has done on Hussein. But Abbas goes towards Hor. He undoes the straps. He undoes all of them and he says, Hor, Imam Hussein is saying that you are his guest. Why don't you come towards Hussein? He says that he comes towards Hussein. In the tradition it says he falls onto the floor and he says to Sayyid al-Shuhada, he says, Sayyid al-Shuhada, 
forgive me and ask your mother to forgive me that I've taken you towards Karbala. At that moment, Hussein says, he says, I've forgiven you and my mother's forgiven you. At that moment, Hur says, but please say the Shahada, I want to go into the battlefield and I want to give my life so that people can say that I was the first person to go so that I've redeemed myself. They say Hur prepares himself. Imam Hussein says, Hur, you can go into the battlefield. Before he goes into the battlefield, Hur looks towards Sayyid the Shahada. He says, but I have one request. He says, what is that request? He says, I want to say something to your sister Zainab. He says, fine, go towards Zainab. He says, he comes towards the tent of Zainab, lowers his head. He says, the daughter of Zahra, Please forgive me that I've taken you towards Karbala. Ask your mother Zahara to forgive me because on the day of judgment I will be unable to take the fact that you come there and you complain about me. At that moment Zainab says, Hur, I've forgiven you and I'll make sure that my mother forgives you as well. At that moment Hur now turns around. He says, son, I want the world to know that I gave a sacrifice for Hussein. Why don't you go and give your life for the sake of Hussein? In the tradition it says his son goes into the battlefield as his son goes goes into the battlefield. The Maqatil say this, they said a voice comes, that voice is this, the son is saying to his father, father accept my final salams. In the tradition it says Hur falls onto the ground and as he gets up a father, old father he says holding onto his back, Hur starts going in towards the Maqtal. As Hur goes towards the Maqtal, he sees as he gets there, Sayyid the Shuhada is sitting there with the head of his son and he has his hand on the head of his son. At that moment Hur says, oh, Mala, how comes he got it so fast? Imam Hussein gives him one reply. He says that a father should never come on to the body of his son like this. I say to Sayyid the Shahada, in a couple of hours later, the tradition says this, an old man walking on his hands and knees will be going towards the body of his son. As he goes to the body of his son, he'll be saying, son, I can't see anything. My eyesight is gone. Why don't you help me? <laughs> For the sake of Muhammad and Abu Muhammad, may Allah accept our worship today. For the sake of Muhammad and Abu Muhammad, may Allah remove the trial and tribulations which are within our life. For the sake of Muhammad and Abu Muhammad, for all of those people who are suffering, May Allah remove their suffering for the sake of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. All of those people who are going through tests, all of those people whose lives are in danger, those people in Pakistan, those people in Afghanistan, Iraq, Sham, Lebanon, the Western world, wherever they may be, may Allah protect their life, their property, and their possessions. One more tradition. In this tradition, they say that whenever you ask for the sake of someone, of the Ahlul Bayt, Allah accepts your du'as. Tonight, raise your hands and ask. They say, ulama say, when a person's du'a is not accepted, ask by giving these three wasilas. Three wasilas, ulama say. Bring all of those things to your mind that you want Allah to fulfill. First pray for other people, <laughs> then pray for yourself. They say that if your du'a is not accepted, ask Abbas, <laughs> For the sake of Sakina, for the sake of those slap marks on her face, for the sake of the blood it is, ask Abbas, Abbas for the sake of your Sakina, first last time. Second one was Sila that you should take, ask Imam Zaman, say Imam Zaman, for the broken rib of your mother Zahara, second one. It says in the tradition, third one, it says now ask the third, what is that third one? Ask say the Shahada for the sake of Ali Akbar. Oh. <laughs> for the sake of Ali Akbar, may Allah accept all of our du'as. May Allah hasten to the door of the Imam and make us all part of his Ansar. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>